Good afternoon. If I can get your attention, please. So we're um, <clears throat> we're now we're now post midterm number two, right? Cruising to the finish line. Lots and lots of examples coming up, um, and everything is going to be. We're going to be doing a lot of this. Sum of f is equal to m a. Right, x and y direction, sum of moments, et cetera. And so I've got a couple examples today. Maybe I'll, I'll get through two of them for sure, maybe even a third one. Uh, and then by next week, we're going to be even talking about work and energy, momentum, impulse of rigid bodies. But I wanted to bring back uh, an old example, an old example from the whole pulley section back when we were doing particles. But I'm going to put a rigid body twist to the problem. And here's the old problem. You'll remember that I did something along the same lines where I had a mass hanging down from a pulley, but I replaced the mass with just a force that was the same as the weight. And I asked you about acceleration and velocities. And as it turns out, the answers are actually different, whether it's a mass hanging down or an actual force. Uh, and I'm going to repeat that problem, but with a rigid body. And in this case, we're dealing with a flywheel. What I mean by a flywheel is anything that's heavy is like in a disk shape and is used to have angular and rotational inertia. That is the meaning behind having a flywheel. I've given you some information here. So the idea is, is as follows. There's an outer disk. And then there's even an inner hub to this outer disk. It's like a, another disk that's just welded onto this big disk. And so there's two radii that are of interest because of this odd shape. One radius is not good enough to describe it. And therefore, calculating the mass moment of inertia might be a little bit more challenging. So guess what we're doing? We're going to give you the radius of gyration. Right? So when we give you this, more easy to calculate Ig. Okay? So I've given you two radii. And then we're going to ask you for the following. We're going to say that flywheel is initially at rest. Omega naught is 0. And we're going to ask you to do the following. Find angular acceleration alpha in both cases, and this velocity at the top of the flywheel v top vector. OK? So let's start, let's start with A, the easier one. It's easier because, really, I've given you the two forces FA and FB, right? So when you look at this problem, if I were to figure out, try to figure out angular acceleration alpha, the first thing that you should do is just simply think Maybe all I need is the moment equation. If I sum the moments about my fixed point O, it should just be I O alpha. Right? And then, of course, there's the sum of f in the x and y as well. But if we just started with this, here's the, here's the way the equation would get expanded out. We're basically saying you know, this is our conventional counterclockwise positive rotation. So FA is going to create the positive rotation. It would literally be FA multiplied by the moment arm, which in this case is RI. And then FB, because it's yanking down on this side of the disk, it's going to create clockwise rotation. So that's actually going to be a negative FB RO, because it's on the outside of the disk now. Okay, So those are the two forces acting on it, moments. Some reaction forces at the pin joint, but they don't create any moments because there's no moment arm. And then we're left with IO alpha on the left. What's IO? IO is, maybe I'm forgetting something here. I'm also forgetting what the FA and FB are. So FA is 23.5 newtons. FB is 23.5 newtons. Those are given to you. And then to recreate that problem that I did in the particle section, what I'm going to do is A and B will have masses, and they will have exactly 2.4 kilograms of mass, and that gives me the same force as that. Okay? So there you have it. More data for you. Okay, so back to, back to this equation. It's going to be really easy. Our IO in this case coincides with the center of mass. So IO and IG are exactly the same thing. And using the uh, radius of gyration, that's it, right? No need to do any fancy integrals or anything like that. Just take your mk squared. 
And right away, we will have 0 0.109 kilogram meters squared. And with my two Fs and my two Rs, immediately you can solve for alpha. Alpha is just simply going to be negative 12.9 radians per second squared. Okay? So negative meaning that it is opposite my counterclockwise convention for positive rotation. So really, really easy. No need to even do sum of forces in the x and y. What happens to, part, to case b then? Well, for case b, we've learned this before, we cannot assume that the forces that are acting on the flywheel are just the weights of the masses. In fact, we actually end up with three free body diagrams. So you'll remember that for block A, your free body diagram should be MAG up, and then there should be a tension up. And then for block B, same thing, MBG down, but a TB up. Right? Understanding that both of these will have positive y in the upward direction. And then I can further draw my flywheel free body diagram. And so now instead of writing F, A, and F, B, the idea is, yes, you're going to have some reaction forces. Let me call them R, Y, R, X. Right? They're at the center of the wheel, obviously. And then these tensions that are associated with block A and block B they must be equal and opposite to the tensions on the flywheel. So that would be my TA, and this would be my T sub B. Right? And so given this as our problem, we now uh, definitely need to have a full set of equations for all three of these bodies. OK, okay so let's go through that analysis and see what happens. OK, so let's work through this. Let's go through block A. Should be pretty simple. Should be a TA minus MAG. Now will be equal to MA acceleration of A. Block B, TB minus MBG is equal to MB. A, B, okay, and then for rotation, so flywheel, let's do positive counterclockwise again, sum of moments in the O, I, O, alpha, and now if we look at the diagram, I'm replacing my F, A, F, B with T, A, T, B, so T, A, R, I, minus T B R O. Okay. So here's the thing: T A and T B currently unknown, right? That's why we needed these extra equations. But what else? What else appears to be unknown here? So T A T B, coupled with these two equations, and also A A and A B, are also currently unknown. I actually have four unknowns right now. And I'm missing the all-important alpha that I wanted to solve. Right? I need to solve alpha. So here's the deal. If you think about where the ropes are connected, these ropes, if this is an acceleration of A up and down, A sub A, and this is my acceleration A sub B, those are actually the tangential components of the acceleration acting right at the point when the rope meets, uh, re, uh, meets the flywheel. So those are, in fact, your alpha capital R's. Right? So all you have to do here is make sure you got the signs right, but I'm going to substitute this AA with an alpha times RI. And so it should be an MA alpha times RI and negative sign because if, in fact, AA were to be positive up, 
positive up is actually clockwise for that side of the flywheel. Compare that to MBAB. My AB is therefore going to be positive alpha RO, right? Alpha RO for the magnitude of the tangential acceleration. And then if it's AB, if that happens to be positive, it, it causes counterclockwise rotation of the flywheel, therefore the positive sign. So finally, we're down to our three unknowns, TA, TB, and alpha. And then you just solve the set of equations. Okay, so I'll give you, I'll give you the solution. Um, see here, alpha is equal to negative 6.38 radians per second squared. You can check that at home. And I'll even give you your TAs and TBs. TA is going to be 25.4 newtons. TB is 20.8 newtons. And you can see how these two values, after you've solved the set of equations, is different from the 23.5 newtons of force that we apply to case A. OK, so those are your answers. Uh, and then let's, let's loop back for a second, because I think I forgot to mention what the solution for V top was, right? So if, once you solve the alpha, then it's all easy from here. So once you have alpha, Okay, all the forces are, are the same acting over time. So this alpha is clearly going to be a constant. Right? So in case A, how do you find velocity? Well, the idea is you actually want to know, I think I was going to ask a slightly more complicated question here. It was going to be, oh, I see. Find V top at T is equal to Find V top at T is equal to 2.5 seconds. Okay? So if you're asked that, then it, it becomes the following. You're basically asking final angular velocity omega f would be your omega naught plus a constant ex angular acceleration times the t. And then once you have the omega f, so this would be a, you know, the 12.9 that I had previously multiplied by 2.5 seconds. So omega f for part a would have been just give you the v top here. V top 5.8i meter per second. And then for back to, back to case B, same thing if you want to check this, but V top <coughs> 2.87i meter per second. OK? So I won't bother you with the, uh, with the detailed calculations. It's actually really simple from here on out. I just wanted to show you the, the method of solving these problems and the need to consider multiple bodies if you have masses hanging off of a flywheel, et cetera. Any questions on that? The rest of the math is pretty easy, yeah. Yeah. So the, the, que the, question, the question is in regards to which, mo which way the flywheel is going to move and how to keep your sign straight. You got to realize that the equations that I wrote here, I have actually haven't assumed that I knew the direction at all. But what I did do was make sure that all of my signs were consistent. Right? That was the key. So let's go through how consistent I was with my signs. I said positive y was up. And I said counterclockwise was positive rotation, right? So I'm basically saying, look, upward TA force minus a downward MAG force 
And that's got to be equal to, on the particle, it would be on the, on the block, which we consider to be a particle, MAAA. On the AA, if AA is going to be positive, it goes up, right? Positive Y, the rotation of the flywheel would have been negative alpha RI. Right? So the negative sign takes into account this, you know, count this clockwise rotation if alpha were a positive number. Right? So this way, I know that if the number pops out, it has to be a positive alpha with a minus sign in front. In this case, the same positive alpha number for counterclockwise rotation, keeping the positive sign in front of it. Right? And that's on the right-hand side of the flywheel. So consistency is the key. Right? Consistency is the key. Um, otherwise, I actually did not even assume the, the direction of, of, the, of the flywheel. And in fact, my answer shows that. Right? My answer says negative. What does this mean? This means that because I kept everything consistent and I didn't guess which direction the flywheel went, the negative sign means that, oh, I guessed, I guessed that my convention was positive counterclockwise. This now means that it must be clockwise, right? OK? Does that make sense? OK, so that's your first example. Let me do another example here. So my second example is going to be, we'll do a battering ram example. So this battering ram example is like the following. Okay. So the idea here is you've got two lengths of rope, and you've got a large, this is a battering ram, just a large log. Um, and so consider this large cylindrical object hanging from the ceiling with these two, two lines. So what's going to happen when the ropes swing down like this? So these both have, similar, have the exact same lengths. So I can tell you for sure that this point C, the end of this rope, which direction must the velocity of the end of this rope go? It must be 90 degrees, perpendicular to RC with respect to A. Right? So it goes in this direction. So this is my VC with respect to A. Right? And then this point here, my VD, also must be 90 degrees, VD with respect to C, uh, B. Right? So basically, every single point, including the center of mass, point G, also 90 degrees down, right? So what is the, what is the battering ram doing? It's actually doing this, right? Swinging down like this, right? Okay, and so this is actually curvilinear translation, right? So the battering ram itself, clearly not rotating. It's not doing this. It can't do that based on the way that I've drawn the system. So it must do this. And the translation, the, the, point, the, the path that G travels and all the other points travel, they must be a curved path. It must be a circle. Okay, so what are we asking here? Let me give you some dimensions. The ropes are initially at 60 degrees with the horizontal. Uh, and I'll tell you that the length of the battering ram is 3 meters. So from C to D is 2 meters. And then D to the end of the battering ram, that's 1 meter. Like that. Okay, and then I'll just indicate here that the whole thing just swings down, right? OK. 
okay. Okay, so a few things here. We're going to say that angular velocity initially is 0. Actually, it's 0 not just initially, but all the time, right? Because it's, it's translating. Mass is 150 kilograms. We'll say it's released from rest. And the question asks to find the cable tensions. Okay, So the tensions in the rope at this particular instant in time when the ropes are at 60 degrees. OK. So free body diagram. G point straight down. So this will be MG. And then TA. And right here, TB. OK. So let's set up all three equations. And so this is pretty this is pretty easy. Right? So you can definitely do do that. Those are your forces. There's no mg in the x. And then we have an m a. And so here is my first reminder or reminder once again. The idea is make sure that you talk about a g. So it's now the acceleration around the center or at the center of mass and in the x direction, OK? So if you're going to use these equations, it has to be at point G for rigid bodies. This is now going to be TA sine 60, TB sine 60, and then even the mass of the battering ram minus mg. And this will be magy. Okay. There's no there's no fixed point of rotation in this problem, right? No O. So logical choice stick back or go back with G, the center of mass. And so the idea here would be T B. So now let's look at the way it rotates again. Let's just work on our conventions. So our point G is here. Anything on this side that's causing this type of rotation, that's a negative. But this side, going this way, is causing, causing positive rotation. And I'm only concerned with the perpendicular part, right? the part that actually create, creates the moment. Okay? So what does that mean? It means I'm going to take my TB, and I'm only going to use my sine 60 component. Okay? And all I need is the distance from here to here as my, as my moment arm. So let me indicate that by, I'll say this is the, the length from D to G. And then I'm going to do subtract, again, following my sign conventions, TA sine 60. And then now I want the moment arm to be the distance from C to G, right? Line CG. And then MG, does that have a moment on it? mg multiplied by moment arm? No, nothing, right? No mg. OK? So there you have it. And then i got to ask you this question. What do you think the sum of these moments should be ig times alpha? What would alpha be? 0, right? 
has to be zero because omega is always zero. It's curvilinear translation, so no omega, no alpha. Right? So now we've got our, our three equations, TA, uh, uh, three equations, and how many unknowns do we have? TA, TB, and then this A, G, X, and Y. So what's A, G, X, and Y? OK, so let's draw, let's draw the diagram again. But this time, I'll focus on just looking at the accelerations. So I'm going to draw the, the battering ram. Here's my G. OK, now tell me, if I, kn if I want to find the acceleration at point G, two components, right? AG tangential and AG normal. So I told you earlier that the velocities are all swinging down like this. That means that is the path of all of these points. That means this is going to be my AG, and that's my tangential, clearly. Right? And all these points are moving in a circle, so that's the concave side. Therefore, my AGN is like that. Right? Makes sense, but AGN has a magnitude of what? Omega squared RG. It's zero, because omega is nothing, right? So there's no an when it's curvilinear translation. So now that means I can boil it down to just this agt. And this agt, even though I don't know the magnitude of it, I can certainly break it down into two components. I can break this agt down into just the y component, and it will have an x component. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry? Yeah, absolutely. I was going to show that as my second way to do it, right? And you get a little bit, it, it's like a few lines faster, OK? But if you, if you want to do it this way, and you know, this was my, my best way of just starting from basic principles to make sure that you guys understood where I was coming from. But here's the deal. We know the magnitude of AGT. The magnitude of AGT, uh, must be equal to AG, that's AGXI plus AGYJ, and my AGX must therefore be an AG the tangential part multiplied by a cosine 30. And then AGY must be equal to my AGT sine 30, right? So I can plug that now back into those e two equations and solve for all three. And so let me show you how that works. I'll just now substitute all AGX and AGY accordingly, even though they're unknown. So I'll do TA plus TB. So for the first equation, group the TAs and TBs, cosine 60 is equal to my m a g oops and then t a plus t b is equal to minus mg,
Okay? And then I just did some rearranging. So if you rearrange, I can actually eliminate the TA and TB for now. So eliminate the TA plus TB, and you'll get the following. MAG cos 30 plus MAG cos 30 is equal to MG. Right? So I just did some rearranging around there and simplified my symbol for AG. And then finally, you can solve for AG, and it will be equal to Okay. So essentially, the whole the whole battering ram is the 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 acceleration of this g point is it is going down that way in this direction, right? And that's the magnitude of it. And once I have that, I can go back and solve for ta and tb. Okay. So go back to solve TA and TB. Uh, so let me take this equation here. MAG And then one more substitution in the moment equation from this sum of moments of g, you'll actually get Tb is this. So if TB is 3 times TA, now you know which, which tension belongs to, uh, to which rope. So TA will be 318.5 and 955.5. Um, and you'll, and you'll notice it actually makes a lot of sense, right? It makes a lot of sense. Why? Because clearly the rope that is further away from G, which in this case is the rope of TA, requires less force to generate a same amount of moment, right? So it's almost like if you, if you know the ratio between this length and the other length, this is the 1.5 meters, this is 0.5. And that's just because of the way that I, I drew this 2 meters to 1 meter. G is halfway between the 3, so it's 1.5. If you look at the ratio between those distances, that's what drives the difference between TA and TB. OK? OK, and then, and then the student actually pointed out something really nice. Let me go back to this board and just draw it once for you. Um, all it comes down to is like maybe if you oriented so another way to do it So here's my G, right? My MG. And I did a TA and a TB. You could have equally or you could have found the solution just the same if you rotated your axes. If you just looked at it this way, right? then all of these, the TA and TB, would be straight in the y direction. Then all you would have had to worry about was essentially taking this acceleration. And so the thing would be swinging down this way. And that would have been my AG. And in that case, my AG would be only in this x direction. Right? So then the only force that you actually had to break up into two components 
mg instead of only in the y, it would be two components. Okay, exactly the same answer. Any, any questions or thoughts on that? Okay, so let me do one more. It's not too difficult, right? Okay, let me do some rolling wheels for you. I'll do another case A and another case B. So here's, here's what I want to do. I want to, I want to ask the question, with just, without numbers, but just theoretically, what do you think happens when I pull the wheel here with a force P, and the wheel tips and has an angular acceleration that way? And there's going to be a friction force on the surface. And in, my, in these cases, I want to say rolling without slip, like we've been doing. And so for the first time, I want to investigate friction forces that might be involved. So let me assume, for, an, for, for example, that I know that the friction force is acting in that direction, opposite the direction of motion, perhaps. And for case B, what I want to do is I want to take the exact same P force, but instead of applying it to the center of the wheel, I want to apply it to the top. And it tilts tips over, and it's again going to be angular acceleration alpha. Here's my G point. And again, I want to see what the friction force is, right? Okay, so there are your two cases, rolling without slip, perfect circular disk. And the question is the following, find sort of an analytical solution, friction force FF in terms of the mass of the disk, the radius of the disk, and applied force P. So we want everything just in symbol form, M, R, and P. And I'm going to throw a tiny little twist into this problem. I'm going to force everybody to think positive rotation is clockwise, just for fun. Okay. Okay, so again, consistency is all that matters, right? I can make this, I can make my convention anything I want. Only problem is now don't make sure you don't use your right hand rule, because it's not right hand anymore. So we're gonna do sum of forces in the X is M A G X. And we already know something for a fact, right? Every time it's a rolling circular disk without slip. We know that the AG is the point that goes in a straight line, and we also know that it must be equal to alpha r. Right? It just has to be. Right? And we, we proved that, right? We proved that several lectures ago. Okay, so if, you're, if, you, if you don't believe that, then you should go back to your notes. Sum of forces in the x, so the way that I've drawn that diagram, it looks to me like it's going to be P minus FF is M alpha r. Okay, what else do I need? So there are forces in the Y, but the forces in the Y are going to be mg and normal. Okay, so, so I can write that, but it's not going to help us. And then I've got mg is ig alpha. ig alpha. Okay, so ig for a perfect disk, 1 half mr squared alpha. And then moments that create a positive clockwise rotation, 
based on my convention. Basically, the way I've drawn it, it has to be equal to friction force times R. Right? OK, so keeping everything in symbol form. I'm going to rearrange this. FF is equal to, oops, alpha is equal to 2FF over MR. 2FF over MR, yeah. And then I'm going to plug this into the first equation, sub into first equation. So it looks to me like FF is a positive P over 3. So whatever pulling force you happen to be applying, friction force will be in that opposite direction, P over 3. OK. So what happens to case B? The sum of forces in the x, m a g x, m alpha r. Okay, so what, what has changed? Well, instead of just the friction force, right, it's the p force is no longer acting through g, right? So it's got to be FF times R plus a P times an R. Both of those are actually creating moments about G. Okay, so that means I can do the following P and FF, factor it out. Looks to me like that's going to be equal to. Doo -doo -doo. times r is equal to 1 half m r squared. And I'm going to look to my first equation. I forgot to write that this is going to be my regular p minus ff, right? OK, so I'm going to substitute in my alpha with p minus ff over mr. OK, so what did you guys get? P plus FF is equal to, so one of the R's cancel, the other MR's cancel, 1 half P minus FF. So it's going to be 2P plus 2FF, P minus FF. And FF is equal to? Negative p over 3. OK, so negative sign, what does that mean? So it means that in this diagram, I guessed wrong on the friction. The friction force is actually acting this way. Right? And you can prove it to yourself. If you flip the direction of the FF, right, you will actually get it that you've got the right the right direction, right? And my P is three times the length of that friction force. So what's happening, what's happening physically? Why did friction force change all of a sudden in direction? So, so the thought experiment that I want you guys to think about is the following, right? 
when, when a rigid body is moving and it's doing both the translation and the rotation, let's think about what would have happened if, if we didn't have the, the ground at all. If we didn't have the ground at all, in this case, if you're pulling the wheel straight at the center of mass, what would it be doing? It would be translating. There was no ground there, right? And you were only applying a force at the center of mass, so concurrent forces, right? So no rotation. So what's the purpose of the friction force? The idea is that the wheel is rolling without slip, so it has to tip that way, but P is not doing any of the rotation. So we need a friction force there with just enough moment to turn the wheel this way, right? So it's almost like the friction force was responsible for pushing this part of the wheel to the left so that the thing could turn, right? Conversely, look at this problem right here. If I took away the floor, what do you think the P force is actually doing? It is not only translating it to the right, it naturally has a moment that is already making it rotate, right? But, but guess what? If you left it without the ground and it was rotating, it would actually be rotating with a higher angular acceleration, a higher alpha than what would make sense for rolling without slip on the ground. So what is the purpose of the friction force that acts in the opposite direction? It's actually there to create like an opposite moment, just to prevent the P force from making it spin too fast. And that opposite moment allowed the wheel to tip just the right amount rolling without slip. OK? Yeah? No right hand rule. Ignore right hand rule. I purposely tricked you guys, right? In this particular case, I've defined a different convention, OK? So make sure that's clear. Anything, any questions on that? It's actually a pretty important concept, right? And you know what? I can actually give you a third case just before you guys go. I'll give you guys my third and final case. Right? And the third and final case is as follows. There's actually a point here in the wheel between G and the top. If you apply this force right at that location, friction force is actually equal to zero. OK? Meaning the friction is there, right? The friction is there. There's static friction there. It forces that point to be the instantaneous center of zero velocity. Everything is still physically correct, but the value of that static friction is so close to zero, right? Because there's no need for it to actually apply a moment to turn the wheel. The P force itself is both translating and rotating it. Even without the ground, it would rotate with the correct angular acceleration to match that of rolling without slip. OK? And I'll give you the, uh, give you the distance for that. P is basically going to be applied at R over 2 above G, halfway in between. OK? So try it out for yourself using the, the equations that I just derived for you. See for yourself what happens to FF. All right? Any questions? All right, we did three examples. We're well ahead of schedule. Have a good weekend. Tough week with the midterm, right? Catch your breath. More dynamics next Monday.